It is time for us to begin. If uh, y'all come in, take your seats, and we'll get started here in just a, just a moment. It has been a great day so far. Uh, we're about to close out our afternoon uh, lectures here. Brother Michael Bates is with us from Batesville, and he didn't send me a biography. He told me he would. Now, he, I do have an email from him, just so he knows. I do have an email from him that says I will, and he didn't. So uh, I told him if he didn't, I would just make stuff up. Um, but I don't know him well enough to make stuff up, so I'll let Bill. Bill can make stuff up. Y'all yeah. know Bill. Bill can make stuff up. Of course, I hate to cut Bill loose telling stories. We may never get out of here. Um, but thankful for uh, Michael's willingness to come over and speak to us today. Uh, he is going to be speaking on Christian leadership in the home, and uh, I'll just leave it at that. He's going to speak to us in just a moment. Before he does... Brother Bill Franz is going to come lead us in a word of prayer. Michael Bates, before I pray, I, you know, I can't do this without telling you something. Before I came over here, I drove from my house in Oxford, I drove 40 mile round trip three times a week to hear this guy preach and to be a part of that congregation and that's a fabulous congregation over there as well, led by some dedicated elders and a very good minister. But a story that uh, Mike Bates told me one time when he got over there and got ready to get his utilities hooked up, he called the, I don't know which one it was, maybe the electric company of the who was it? Bell South. He called Bell South. He said, I'd like to get my telephone, get my telephone hooked up. She said, may I have your name, please? He said, my name's Michael Bates. What city are you in? Batesville. What street do you live on? Bates Street. She said, I do not have time to play games. <laughs> She said, now let's start over. What is your name? Michael Bates. What city do you live in? Batesville, Mississippi. What street do you live on? Bates Street. She said, are you telling me the truth? Yes, ma'am. Would you please hook up my telephone for me? She said, yes. But I remember that story. I love this guy. And you will too. Gracious and loving Heavenly Father, what a privilege it is to have the opportunity to come to you and stand before you and offer our praise to you. We would do that first whenever we come together and whenever we speak to you, is to praise you. You mean so much to us in our lives what you've done for us, what you've done for us through your Son. And what a wonderful privilege it is to assemble with other like-minded Christians who love you, love your Son, and are so grateful for all that you've done for us. We've been so blessed this weekend to have this meeting with these wonderful speakers, this wonderful fellowship, this wonderful time together to renew ourselves, to hear the principles given to us through your inspired word. We're so grateful for your inspired word, for our instruction book, so that we would know how you would have us to live. We are so grateful for the promise we have of life eternal with you when our time comes. 
What a wonderful, what a wonderful blessing to look forward to. Dear God, we ask you to be with Michael as he speaks to us here in a minute. Especially that you would open our hearts and minds to receive what he has to say. To take it with us as we leave this place this afternoon. And remember, and use it in our lives and use it in our relationships with those around us, within our families, with those with whom we come in contact each day. May we be the example you would have us to be as we live our lives and that we might have the the goals and the successes of bringing other people to you to enjoy what we have that are outside of your kingdom. I offer this prayer in the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Fromm, for remembering anything I've ever said. <laughs> Notice he didn't quote any sermons that he had heard me preach. <laughs> a little funny story. I'm gonna. I was looking over the schedule, and as I noticed that uh, many of you have would have been here for a good part of today, I said, you know, I I don't know if I'm gonna get behind the pulpit and maybe lecture. I'm gonna get out on the floor so if anybody starts dozing, I can slap them in the head, and keep them awake. Just kidding. Uh, but uh, I. I I do like kind of being down here with the folks, uh, especially on a Saturday afternoon. And I hope we can study together and grow together in our knowledge of God's Word and our practice of it. Uh, I'm uh, just an old Tupelo boy. I grew up uh, born over there at North Mississippi Medical Center in Tupelo, Mississippi. Uh, was raised in the church at Verona. Uh, left there and went to school at Freed Hardman. And when I graduated there, I moved to Batesville, Mississippi, and I've been there now for 30 years. I'm very grateful for that. Uh, the brethren over there are so very good to me and very kind. There are some of you uh, who uh, come through there from time to time with your work. Uh, there are some uh, here uh, that may work at the Tennessee Gas Company out west of town, and, and some have come by to visit with us, and we appreciate that a lot. I appreciate the vision for having uh, such a day as this and to blend so many uh, speakers uh, over the course of the weekend. I think that adds a lot of variety. I think it helps you as a listener and you're able to learn and grow from a number of different presenters, all teaching from uh, the same book. Uh, well, before I get too much further along, uh, raise your hand if you remember, were you here when Garvis Seymour preached here? Anybody? Okay. Garbus came to us when I was 10 or 11 years old at Verona. And he and Brother Kingsley there are probably the reason that four of us from about the same uh, age bracket uh, left and became preachers. They would have uh, men's training, young men's training classes. We'd get back in the room. We'd learn how to lead singing and give little talks and lead prayer and all of that. And... Uh, before long, they'd let us do it on Sunday nights, and before long, some of us were preaching full-length sermons, and, uh, well, our full-length was about 12 minutes tops. You know, it's always 25 or 30 in your bedroom mirror, and then when you get up in front of folks, I don't know how you can get through it much faster, I guess, with your knees knocking together, you talk a little faster, but uh, that, that was always a joy. When Garvis was here, I was telling a group of men there uh, before I came down the, the aisle a moment ago, I'd moved to Batesville for a couple of years probably, and he was preaching here. And, uh, the area-wide youth service that I'd been a part of, being in the Tupelo area, uh, you all were hosting it here uh, on a Monday night, I think, and he uh, had this really great speaker lined up and something happened with that guy's flight plans or he got hung up in traffic somewhere and he said he's not going to be able to make it Michael can you come and I said well Garvis I appreciate being your second choice but yeah I'll, I'll drive over tonight and come but thanks for thinking of me uh, 
Jarvis and I have always had a great relationship, even when he was down at Magnolia Bible College in Kosciuszko, and then later down at Madison, the church there, uh, just uh, outside of uh, Jackson. And we've had him a few times in Batesville for summer series and gospel meetings and various things. And he's, uh, I tell you, I, I owe a lot to Garvis Seymour. Uh, I thought what we'd do today, Christian leadership in the home. Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 5. I don't know who said it first, but I've heard it said all my life. So goes the home, so goes the nation, so goes the world. I can uh, think about our title, our topic for this hour, Christian Leadership in the Home. There are an awful lot of homes in the world that don't have any kind of leadership in their home, much less Christian leadership in the home. Uh, some of the things I think that we are seeing more and more abundantly in our society that used to be done in the darkness or in the shadows, uh, someone has said now is parading uh, proudly down Main Street. Uh, many years ago, and I can go back uh, before my time at Freed Hardeman, but one of the first lectureships they had when I was in school at Freed Hardeman was about the home. Uh, the restoring or restoration of the, the family, the home, as God would have it. And it just so happened, too, when I was in school uh, there, that there was a great emphasis uh, upon those getting Bible degrees, ministry degrees, even in graduate school, all the classes on counseling and on the home and the family that you could possibly take would be nothing but a benefit. When I was a student sitting in those classes, I thought there is no way that I will ever need as much of this as what I am taking in these classes. And boy, was I wrong. Uh, I counsel probably most of the day, nearly every day. Uh, counseling is just a part of ministry, whether it's individual counseling, pre-marriage counseling, marriage counseling. Uh, sometimes uh, parents come and they need help, so we do some parental counseling, counseling young people who have gotten their lives, you know, off track, and you know, some are being raised by parents, some by grandparents, some by aunts and uncles, and so family dynamics certainly are, are not always the same under every roof, and so there are an awful lot of things to consider when you think about Christian leadership in the home. But I only have one session, okay? And so the way I uh, thought I was supposed to go with this is to think about the Christian leadership of men in the home. And we'll have time to look at the role of a husband as a Christian leader. And then maybe the role of a father as a Christian leader in the home. And I don't have to tell you how important those two roles are in God's system. Uh, for the family. When you think about God creating Adam and saying to, to about Adam, it is not good that man should be alone. I'll make a help meet or a helper or a suitable companion for him. And then he performed the, the first uh, anesthesiology, caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and took from his rib, you know, and made woman and she shall be called a woman. And when Adam first came to, he looked at her and he said, Whoa, man. And that's why she's called a woman, right? Uh, there's no doubt that, that Eve was very beautiful, at least to Adam. And, uh, and so that, that was going to be the foundation for the family. Uh, for they would have children. Now, not, not all families, you know, were problem free. I didn't know if you knew that or not but uh, you probably did, but, but families are not problem-free, are they? Uh, as soon as we get out of the first sin, you turn your uh, page in the Bible to Genesis chapter 4, and you have Cain and Abel, their sons, and they can't get along. One becomes jealous of another over their sacrifices, one uh, being acceptable, one unacceptable, and all of a sudden one of the brothers has killed the other. 
Uh, when you look that up in 1 John chapter 3, as John, through the Holy Spirit, is writing that, the term for slew his brother or killed his brother there is literally butchered. And so it was a very violent act. And here you have already a problem in the family. And I could go on and on. We, we could talk about David and his family. We could talk about David and his children, their relationship to him, their relationship to one another. Uh, but again, those are things that I encourage you to study out, uh, you know, as you, you, you know, go forth from today. But what about the husband and his Christian leadership in the home? Well, in Ephesians chapter 5, we learn in verse uh, number 22, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Now, here you've got wives being the ones spoken to, but I have found that, I don't know if it's just in our culture, maybe just the experience I had growing up and hearing men talk about this particular verse, but I don't know that the Lord ever intended for husbands to make your wives submit. And I'm also pretty sure that doesn't mean that I come home and I sit down in a chair and I order my wife around. I don't think that's what's meant here. I think what the Lord is trying to teach us, and we'll see why in just a moment, is that here he's talking about he has the spiritual leadership. Look, look how the context continues. For the husband is head of the wife, even as Christ is head of the church. And he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let their, uh, the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Now notice this. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Now I know there's not a period there, but let's just put a mark there for just a moment. If you want to think about one of the greatest responsibilities a man will ever have, it's when he becomes a husband. And to understand that the Lord has taught every husband to love his wife as Christ loved the church. You know, in John 13, a similar expression is used. When Jesus is telling his disciples a new commandment I give unto you that you love one another. But then <laughs> he gives it a little bit clearer understanding, doesn't he? As I have what? Loved you. So you ought also love one another. And by this all men shall know that you are my disciples. Okay? Okay. And so, similarly, the Holy Spirit here guides Paul's hand to say, Husbands, you love your wives as Christ loved. As Christ loved the church. And he is the Savior of the body. That he gave himself for her. Did you know that Jesus not only gave himself for the church in his death, but Jesus also gave himself for her, his bride, the church, even in his life. His very coming was all about saving mankind, establishing his kingdom upon this earth. The message of John the Baptist was repent. Why? For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The message of Jesus in his early preaching was what? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus came to establish that kingdom, that church. And so as you think about that statement or that phrase there and that overall statement in Ephesians 5, that Christ loved the church that he gave himself for her. Oh, that was the reason he left the splendor and glory of heaven. That's why he came and put on flesh. That's why Jesus suffered and was tempted in all points like we are, yet without sin. That, that's why Jesus went to the cross. That's why he took the scourging. That's why 
he, he was, allowed himself to be hit in the face and spit upon and then crucified. Why? He was giving himself whatever means sacrificially that it would take in order to redeem the souls of mankind, he was willing to do. He'd given himself for the church, his bride. Now, what does it take to do that? If you and I are going to love our wives like Christ loved the church, what kind of mindset does that take? Hold your finger here and let's just turn the book over to the book of Philippians chapter 2. And I want to begin reading at verse number 1. Maybe you're pretty well familiar with this text. But in Philippians chapter 2, Paul from prison writes this, Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Let nothing be done, now here, pay attention, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit that is vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and becoming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. So, in what way did Jesus love the church? What mindset did he have? That's important for us. If we're going to love our wives the way Christ loved the church, we have to understand what his mindset was in doing so. All through that chapter, you have one concept that just jumps off the page. And it's humility, humility, humility. In lowliness of mind, esteem or treat others better than yourself. Look not out for your own things, but also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you. He's describing the qualities of Jesus. He's showing us the mindset of the Christ as he came to lay down his life for our sins and to establish the church with his blood, Acts 20 and verse 28, in doing so. And, and so humility, it's all about humility. And friends, I think sometimes as husbands, we may miss that one key attribute about Christian leadership in the home. Am I leading with humility? The humility of Christ. When I do premarital counseling, I'll have a couple. Most of the time, they're pretty young, early 20s. Every now and then, it's uh, maybe a couple that's advanced in years from, from their early 20s. But I always ask this question, generally in the first session. Whose needs do you most want to see satisfied in this marriage? And almost every time, they will say the other one. They have the right concept in mind. Now, sometimes, I remember one occasion, a young man said, well, you know, if I'm just being brutally honest here, <laughs> the reason I'm getting married is because I'm some of my needs met too. And I said, look, that wasn't the question. <coughs> the question is qualified by the word most. Okay. And are you willing even to give up, even to give up yourself, some of the things that you need, some of the things that you want, so that you can serve the needs of your spouse? Jesus gave up a lot, didn't he? Gave up it all. He gave himself for her. And so... 
The question is, as I'm a husband, I'm a father of three. I have 16-year-old twins that were born right over here in this New Albany Hospital. Okay, there's another connection. Okay, all right. And I now, through our oldest daughter, she and her husband have brought us two beautiful granddaughters. One of them's about to be three in May, the other one be two in August. And so one of the things that you, you learn trying to be the best husband you can be is to follow the attitude of Jesus in your marriage. And I promise you, you you'll have each other if each one is looking out for the best interest of the other one, then both parties' needs are getting met the way God intended them for. And it's not a matter of, well, I'll do this if you do that. It's not a matter of manipulation. It's a matter is that, hey, I, I want to give myself to you just as Christ gave himself up to, for the church. And as long as you have that mindset, you'll, you'll have a happy marriage. But selfishness creeps in, doesn't it? What is wrong with us? A very good friend, she was an elder's wife. If you've ever been to Freed Hardeman well, years ago, you'd have seen the Loden Daniel Library. He was one of the elders that hired me in baseball. He's now passed on, been gone several years. But his good wife, Patsy, is still living. She did a series in our, uh, through our congregation and our community that was called Loving Your Husband. And World Bible School, I think, actually videoed her doing those classes. My wife went through those classes uh, soon after uh, we moved to Batesville. And uh, one of the things that she suggests in her Loving Your Husband's class is the very thing that I'm saying about husbands right now. If you treat the other one the way you want to be treated, didn't Jesus say something about that somewhere in Matthew 7, 12? Okay. Do unto others as you would what? Have them do unto you. And if we'd learned the spirit and the mind of Christ in the way we treated our spouses, is that Christian leadership? See, the world wouldn't think so. The world didn't think the leadership of Christ was the kind of leadership. You know, the Jews that had Jesus crucified said, oh, no, this is not our king. You know, look at these lowly beginnings. Look, look at where he was born. Look, look, look at where he was raised. Oh, no, this, this couldn't be the Messiah. There's no way. Here is a man that washes his own disciples' feet, even Judas, the evening that Judas was going to betray him. But he still washed Judas' feet. See, it's servant leadership. Oh, what a, what a great concept. Well, you're talking about counterculture. You go in the world talking about servant leadership. But I find in a lot of leadership books that I read, that that concept is becoming more and more the norm in very successful companies today. Servant leadership. You remember in Matthew 20 when uh, the sons of Zebedee, they came to Jesus. <laughs> Mother came. When you come in your kingdom, let, let my son sit one on your, help me church, one on your right hand and the other on your what? Your left. And you know, Jesus asked a few questions about how they were willing to suffer. And uh, they, we're ready, we're ready, we're ready. And he said, well, I'm sorry, those places are not mine to give. And when the other apostles heard that, they were filled with indignation. They were upset and angry and stirred around about, here, here two guys want to be placed over us. And Jesus said, look, that, that's the way the Gentile world operates. But it will not so be, be so among you. Whoever will be great among you, let him be your servant. Just as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. There's that little expression again, to give his life. It ties us back into our text, right, in Ephesians 5. Oh, if I could encourage you to do anything, Show humility as a husband as you lead your family, as you lead your wife spiritually. Show humility. Don't be arrogant. Don't be rude. No, don't be an individual that uh, comes off as a know-it-all or somebody that's ruling like a boss over an employee or 
somebody who's uh, just exercising some kind of power or lordship over, over your spouse. I can't imagine that being much of a very loving relationship. And I don't think it's the one he's describing here. I know it isn't. And so when I come back to Ephesians chapter 5, I find that Jesus loved the church that he gave himself for her. I want you to think about that word love for just a moment. When I was in school, I remember, I can't remember what grade I was in, but it was Tupelo City School District. And in one of our classes, the teacher had a prism. And it was just this crystal looking thing, it had many different sides. And the teacher, he would catch the sunlight coming in through the window. And I think the term was, then it was refracted into what? Several different colors, right? Well, that's what I think about when I think about 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4 through 8. And for the sake of time, we're not going to turn there and read. But help me out. Love is patient, and love is what? Kind. Love is not arrogant or rude. We've got a good description of what love looks like. And oftentimes, I encourage my Bible classes uh, to take that and notice how the Holy Spirit gives, us to it, gives it to us. There are some things that love is in that text, and there are some things that love is not. And there are some things that love does in that text, and then there are some things that love does not do. And sometimes when you break it down into the is and the is not and the does and the does not, sometimes practically it helps us a little better to understand what he's saying here. But in essence, hey, seek the good of your spouse Seek the good of your spouse, even if it hurts you. When you think about the love of God, and you think about how much he loved us, look at what Christ suffered. Many years ago at, uh, at Fried Hardeman, at one of the lectureships, Roy Sharp, who had been one of my professors, he gave a lecture, and I'm not going to quote the thing for you, but from this text, he talked about the kind of love that is shown here. The love of Christ was sacrificial. And by the way, he did it in connection to how a husband is to love his wife. His love was sacrificial. Look at what he was willing to give, to give up. His love was sanctifying. The purpose of Christ coming and shedding his blood was so what? That he might cleanse her or sanctify her with the washing of water by the word that he might present to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing and so throughout that lecture there are about five things that he pointed out from this text that shows the kind of love that Christ had that husbands need to have for their mates and you discover those as you study through this We've gotten to the verse to where not only are husbands to love their wives as Christ loved the church, but in verse 28, husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. For he who loves his wife does what? Loves himself. Flip with me to Colossians 3. Colossians chapter 3 and down at verse number 19. Boy, if you ever wanted some cliff note versions, as these two books are very similar in a lot of ways, uh, of what Paul had said there, uh, here, pretty well summed up in one verse, Colossians 3, 8, uh, 3, 19, Husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter toward them. Boy, so much is said in just a brief statement. But when you consider what it means to not be bitter, that old term means to be harsh, to be uncaring and unloving towards someone. Our world is filled with marriages that look like what God said don't let them be like. We have some people in our congregation who in Panola County, uh, they work with a, an organization that helps not only prevent domestic violence, but 
actually in the process of, of trying to aid those getting away from domestic violence. And the stories that they can share, given no names, obviously, <clears throat> I'm blown away at how many people, and I heard a judge say this one time, how many people can stand before a preacher or the justice of the peace or whoever and exchange their vows to one another based on their great love for one another in sickness and in health for richer, for poorer. And then before it's over with, some of the violence, some of the abuse, it's not always, by the way, one-sided. It's not always by one gender in that marriage. It goes both ways. And from people who vowed till death do us part. Husbands, love your wives. He says, and do not be bitter. Don't be unloving. Don't be uncaring. I want to mention something at this point. Do you think that our words carry a lot of weight? I think it's Proverbs 18, verse 21. The power of life and death are in the what? Tongue. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. Words hurt. And just as an example, one of the many ways that husbands can be bitter toward their wives is just in the way that they speak to them. Husbands, now look. You're not talking, I'm not, look, I'm not up here saying I'm, I'm perfect at any of what we're describing here. I'm trying to be better. But words chosen, tone chosen, nonverbal communication that we use, all together important in communicating with anybody, but especially to our wives. The words we choose can be like a spear through the heart. The tone with which we say those words can be harsh, uncaring, unloving. They're bitter. They take no thought for the feelings of others. And they do not show the love that Christ had for the church. They don't even show the love, love your wives as your own bodies. Now, we have a few women in here not going to get them to amen anything. But just for the sake, just for the sake, if anybody in here, you know somebody struggling in their marriage, you've struggled in your marriage, what, whatever the case be, come down to, we're, we're back to Ephesians chapter 5, and look with me at verse 33. Look, look at the summation of that text we read a moment ago. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular, talking about husbands, so love his own wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. I hear men and I hear women. I hear it in my uh, study when counseling, when at the school, talking with just people that pull me aside and say, hey, God, I need to talk about something. These women, the wives, I don't know what my husband wants. I don't know how to be a good wife to him. I'm not giving him what he needs. Husbands, I don't know. I, she said it was fine if I went hunting today. Okay, You know what fine means, right? No, it's fine. You better not. <laughs> okay. So look, hey, this is real life stuff here. I don't know. I don't know what my wife wants. I can't read her mind. I, it's in Ephesians 5:33. You ought to write it down everywhere you look, in your gun case, everywhere. This, this is the secret. God gave it to us right here in verse 33. Let every husband love his wife as himself. You know what every wife in the world wants from their husband? To know that other than God himself, she is your first love. 
You love her and you love spending time with her more than your buddies. That means step on any toes now. More than your four-wheeler. More than your four-wheel drive. More than golf. More than hunting and fishing. And I know I love to hear them gobblers this time of year. I love it when the bucks are in rut. I love it. But your wife needs to know that you value her. You love her the way Christ loved the church. You love her above and beyond all those things. And guess what? It's in what you do. It's in how you show it. That, that's the secret. Women, we got a few in here. You hadn't figured out that man yet. He told you right here in this verse. And let the wife see that she reverence or respect her husband. This man is kicked and he is put down. He may have a job where people yell at him all day. He feels less than maybe others. Sometimes in our materialistic society, he doesn't feel as though he's doing as good for his family as old so-and-so over here, like it was a competition. He may feel about this tall most of the time. But if he comes home to a wife that shows that she respects him, she speaks to him and about him in front of the children, in front of the grandchildren, in front of members of the church, members of the community, their friends. She speaks so highly of that man. Let me tell you something. He'd get up and go after it again and will gladly do so with the love of Christ, that humility, that mind of Christ. He'll go out and he'll do anything you ask him to do if he knows you respect him and if you show you respect. In more recent years, I wish I could remember the authors, there was a book and workbook put out that was simply called, it's in the marriage counseling circle, Love and Respect. <laughs> hey, the Lord told us about that a long, long time ago. Love and Respect. Okay? I want to touch just a second. It's 3.15. How much time do I have? To, I don't think the next speaker till 6.30, right? <laughs> Jesse laughed first he, he won't sit here that long let me touch on, on parenting as, as a father okay. I'm down to we're in Ephesians 6 we'll just stay there a minute fathers do not provoke your children to wrath but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord in Colossians what many would call a parallel passage. Um, you find uh, that don't, don't provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Let's, let's touch on this just a minute. Bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, but don't provoke them to wrath. To nurture has the idea of giving something what it needs for its survival for, and for healthy growth. I know people who nurture plants. Anybody nurture plants and flowers in here? Okay. You, you give them water. You give them sunshine. You might give plant food. Okay. Uh, any number of what? Various fertilizers. Whatever's needed, right? So we nurture. We baby those plants, especially when they're very young, Try to get them to grow. Well, the idea here is you bring them up in the nurture. You teach them about the Lord. You give them what they need, really in every respect, physically, mentally, spiritually. Okay, You, you give them what they need in all areas of their growth. But don't forget spiritually. I read a book. Oh, I bet it's been 20 years ago now. And I don't mean to cause any controversy or anything because this could apply to anything okay sometimes we're way more interested in preparing our children for secular worldly things than we are spiritual things and this book that I read just one of the things one of the quotes that I remember he said we live in a world where sports is a religion and the coach is their God 
Now look, I don't have any problem with sports. Late last night, I set up, I watched both uh, women's college basketball games in the Final Four. I wanted to see it. Okay? I, I love playing sports. My kids have played sports. All right? Still do. My 16-year-olds. But there's one thing my children know that Kathy and I are in perfect agreement on. Our congregation knows. And every coach that they've ever had knows. And when new ones come in at the school, they'll say, mm, I heard about you. You're not going to let them play on Wednesday night, are you? <laughs> I said, not even if it's the championship game and they're the star of the team. We put God first. Now, that's just how I do it in my family. I, I believe that's putting the Lord first. Now, that could be with any hobby. That could be with any type of career. Don't be like Lot. Lot did his family a disservice, didn't he? How did he make the choice on whether or not where he was going to go when Abraham in uh, Genesis 13 gave him a choice? What, what, what? You can go anywhere. Well, he saw it way down there. Boy, that was very fertile down there. Didn't care where it was located. Those cities that because of their abomination before the Lord were destroyed with fire and brimstone. He didn't consider those things. Look, as we're giving our children what they need, don't do them the disadvantage of too many advantages. And we think sometimes that all the material things in the world that I can give my child, well, I'll be gone from them in order that they might have all that. No, you, fathers, you've got to find a balance. That's all I'm saying. You've got to find a balance. You can play ball, but, but you've got to remember the spiritual consequences. You can, you can hunt and fish and take hunting trips to go to Texas and kill all those real turkeys that you want to. But look, the spiritual has got to come first. Everything has its place. You have to have priorities. You go back to Deuteronomy chapter 6 and look what it was. He gave them the law and he said, teach this diligently to your children. And when were they to teach it? When you get up and when you lie down. When you walk by the way, they'll be as frontlets before your eyes and put them as a sign on your doorpost. Why? Because spiritual things, things that tie us and give us that relationship to God come absolutely first. We're losing our children. We're losing our children, many of them. And I'm, I know that's a generic statement. And many of it is because we have failed to properly prioritize their spiritual nurturing as we're busy feeding and clothing and all the activities in which they could be a part. Okay? And that's very important. Now, let me ask you this. Right there at the end of that verse, well, he says, don't provoke them to wrath. And then in Colossians 3, what is it, about verse 20 or 21, he says, don't provoke them lest they become discouraged. Now, I've had a lot of people say, what, what does that mean? How, how do I avoid provoking them to wrath? Okay? Number one, telling them that they must do something. But then by your example, you don't show that you follow the same rules. If you say something is right and wrong and they must do the right but you continually do the wrong guess what that's going to produce in the heart of this child here's somebody that says hey here's somebody that doesn't practice what they preach they lose respect for you and then they become what altogether discouraged discipline without love discipline without love is abuse. You should always lead with love. Correction and discipline has to be a part of child's life. If we didn't have it in the 70s when I grew up, <laughs> man, we'd jumped off every bridge in the world. Man, we played rough back then from daylight to dark. Discipline of a child teaches them to learn self-discipline. There's sometimes I have to tell myself no. There are some things I cannot do because they're not right. They're not safe. 
They're not considering the outcome and how it will affect me and other people. Let me tell you something else. Never discipline in anger. But also love without discipline is also not very helpful in nurturing to their development. I met a lady one time and her child had been terribly injured. And in the hospital up at the med in Memphis, she was saying, oh, I'm, I'm never going to scold him anymore. I'm never going to spank his bottom anymore. I, I'm never going to make him go to time out and put his nose in the corner or whatever it was she was doing. And I let all that pass and let him heal up, let him get back home. And later we had a conversation about what she said there in the hospital. I said, I know you love your child. But you will be doing him a great disservice if you love him too much so that you just let him run wild. I said, please don't do that. He wants and needs structure. He needs to know where the boundaries are. He needs to be reeled back in so that he becomes a very productive human being and a productive Christian. And then Hebrews chapter 12 tells us, Our Father in heaven... Whom he loves, what does he do? He chastens, he disciplines. Well, boy, there's so much. Can we have another hour or two? I didn't caught you dozing. Hey, look, I didn't send you that email about my bio because uh, I know I, I gave you a thumbs up that I would. But then two or three more phone calls and then questions about getting the bulletin just right. I'm sorry. And then it slipped my mind. Yeah, forgive me. Yeah. Let's close with a word of prayer. Our Father, we're very thankful. We're thankful for your word. We're thankful for your power and the many good works that you have done in this world. We're thankful for, Father, the opportunity to serve you and the example of Jesus Christ to show us how to do it the right way, the best way. We pray that you would help open our minds and our hearts to this love that Jesus had for the church so that we as husbands can love our wives this way. Give us the mind of Christ. Help us to have humility. Help us to learn to make sacrifices and to, to do things that, whether or not it's returned in the same way as far as love and helpfulness, that we do it anyway, that we follow your example. We pray, Father, that you would, you would help us to bring up our children in a good way, to make sure that they have the things that they, they need as far as physically and mentally and emotionally. But, Father, help us to understand spiritual things, the spiritual training that goes along with bringing up children. You've given them to us, Father, for us to mold and to shape, to bring up in your nurture your admonition, Father. And we just ask that you would give us wisdom in this. It's so very difficult. In the times in which we live, we face challenges uh, in doing so, but, but bringing up children in any age has been challenging. Help us to meet those challenges for the sake of the souls of our children. And help us, Father, as churches, as congregations, to lend support to one another to aid in the, the bringing up children through our Bible classes and our youth programs to be spiritually minded people, to understand this life doesn't last forever. It's not about material things. It's not about this physical earth. But we need to be preparing ourselves to spend eternity in heaven together. Help us, Father. We need your help. Please forgive us. Bless the efforts of this weekend meeting and the good things that have been done already and the things yet to come. Please bless this church and every member of it in Christ's name. Mike Brown's going to come lead us in a song here in a moment.
And after that, Steve Hill, will you come lead us in a closing prayer before we dismiss? The ladies are coming in. We need their voices for this song. Right, Mike? Always. He was, uh, Brother Ed Gallagher earlier today was talking about what's most important in life. And somebody, some, you know, he, he mentioned, you know, some folks might say that providing for my family or raising my kids or loving my wife is most important. And he reminded us that while those things may be important, the most important thing in life is for us to be more like Christ. And I've often said, if, uh, if I put God first in my life, and the more like Christ I am, the better husband I'll be, the better father I'll be. And uh, Michael, thank you for that good lesson and that good reminder. And I'll forgive you for not sending me a bio. That's fine. Appreciate it. But thank you for coming and being with us today. Heard a lot of good things about you, but they all came from Bill. So, never know. We're looking forward to tonight. Um, I'm already, Richard, I'm already looking forward to tonight. Uh, the way things have worked out with this series uh, has been better than I anticipated. And how things have kind of come together with these subjects and our discussions. And at 6.30 tonight... Well, I can't wait to hear Jesse speak on who is the Lord. Because if we're going to be like him, we probably ought to know who he is. And then at 7.30, Mark will speak to us on what it means to be a disciple of Christ. So make some phone calls this afternoon. Get a little rest. Eat something. Uh, but make some phone calls. Let's fill this house tonight. And have a good afternoon. Brother Mike. Let's stand together as we sing this song, number 847. 847, then we'll be dismissed in prayer. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together with cords that cannot be broken. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together, Lord, bind us together with love. There is only one God, there is only one King. There one body that is why we can sing bind us together Lord bind us together with cords that cannot be broken bind us together Lord bind us together Lord bind us together with love Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we've had to come together and, and listen to, to many good sermons and, and speeches today. Lord, we pray that we would take each one of those and, and the lessons learned in them and apply it to our lives and truly try to understand what that means to each of us, that we may fulfill that in a way that would be very much Christ-like. Lord, we thank you for all the many, many blessings you allow us and the the time we have and to come here and worship worship you as, as one body. And Lord, we thank you just for, for all things. Uh, Lord, we pray for everyone that's here. Pray for a safe journey home and back again this evening. Lord, we pray for the word that will be spoken this afternoon, that we may take it to heart as well. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.